Hanımefendiler, beyefendiler, British Council liderliğinde yürütülen Next Generation. Welcome to the Next Generation Turkey um, Research. This is a launch event. Good afternoon. We thank you for coming. This piece of research actually took a year and a half, and we're here to find out the outcomes. I think you've all received the flow. There's going to be a presentation and two different panels to follow suit. First and foremost, a few reminders, if I may. The panel will feature two different languages. So if you'd like to receive a headset, um, kindly raise your hand so we may obtain a headset for you. I guess not, not for the time being. Right, there's someone at the back, kindly um, provide a headset, please. There's another point worth considering. This is going to take three and a half hours approximately. Mm -hmm. If there be an emergency, just bear that in mind, there is security and safety staff around. Make sure to follow the instructions. There's two outside the room, and there's also security um, personnel downstairs. So kindly follow their instructions should there be an emergency. And also, if we need to be evacuated, we don't use the elevators. So bear those in mind. We may now proceed um, with the topic for today, which is the youth segment. Um, just to repeat, you're here to listen to um, the details of this very, very important piece of survey that we're here to find out more about. We'd like to explore how um, youngsters experience their daily living, their dreams, aspirations, anxieties, and concerns. We'd also like to find out how um, and where they actually position themselves according to the outcomes from the study. Furthermore, um, the research tells us more and more um, about youth, um, the starting point of this very piece of survey, the methodology according to which it was conducted, and also some of the points worth underscoring as far as the survey is concerned to be able to get a better understanding of the window through which they approach life. Um, the country director, British Council Turkey, Cherry Goff, would you kindly proceed, please? Hoş geldiniz. Welcome. Many of you are friends of the British Council, but I will just give you a short introduction to what we do. The British Council is the UK's international organization for cultural relations and educational opportunities. Our mission is very simple, which is to create a friendly knowledge and understanding between people in the UK and people in other countries. Using the UK's cultural resources, we aim to make a positive contribution to the countries we work with, changing lives by creating opportunities, building connections, and engendering trust. In 2015, we celebrated 75 years in Turkey. And we're very proud to have touched the lives of many people in Turkey over 77 years now through a pioneering role in educational and cultural initiatives, including the creation of Turkey's Open University, the introduction of sport and play in primary schools, vocational training for the tourism sector, and special needs teaching for hearing impaired, sorry, for hearing impaired children. In the cultural arena, we brought some of the most exciting UK artists, such as Grayson Perry and Anish Kapoor, to Turkey. More recent partnerships include over 100 bilateral science partnerships between UK and Turkish universities through the Newton Katip Çelebi Fund. And last year's research with the Council of Higher Education into the state of English in higher education. We've also developed something I hope you're familiar with, which is an innovative and award-winning new digital platform to bring the arts to more people in more places in Turkey. The British Council believes it's important to listen to young people who are the leaders, shapers, and global citizens of tomorrow, and to work with them to design our programs for the future. 
The purpose of the British Council's Next Generation Research Report is to provide a channel for the voices of young people to be heard and to help us, as well as policymakers, educators and employers who are working together with young people to better understand their needs and to build a brighter future together. You will hear much more about the detailed findings today, but there are just a few things that stand out. Firstly, the high levels of optimism among youth in Turkey, despite the challenges they have reconciling their dreams for the future with their commitment to their families and their communities. Also, their empathy with their fellow citizens and the concerns that they share with young people around the world about inequality and intolerance. Young people here and in many other countries want to help to support stronger and more cohesive communities. And far from being a generation that only thinks of itself, they're actively considering how they can provide better lives for the next, next generation. They care deeply about education, and they also recognize the need for 21st century skills, such as English language proficiency, communication skills, and the ability to develop networks. They want international engagement in cultural and educational opportunities to broaden their horizons. And interestingly, this is also the case in the UK, where over 50% of young people surveyed felt that international engagement was crucial to achieving their goals. Creating those connections and building trust and friendship between people and institutions in the UK and Turkey is at the very core of the British Council's mission. We'd like to thank everyone in Turkey who helped to make this research possible, particularly the young people who participated in the research, as well as the Next Generation Turkey Task Force, our academic advisors, and a special thanks to our research partners, Yada and GDN, and our communications partner, Youth Holding. This research and its recommendations won't provide solutions to all of our shared challenges. But what we really hope is that they will stimulate dialogue among a range of interesting part, interested parties as they work to develop plans, policies, and actions to help young people achieve their aspirations. We very much look forward to kicking off that dialogue with you today. Thank you very much for joining us. We hope you find the presentations thought-provoking. And I personally am very interested and very much looking forward to hearing your ideas, your questions, and your challenges during the Q&A sessions. So thank you again for joining us. I hope you have a very stimulating, interesting, and forward-looking afternoon. Thank you. Thank you um, to the country director, Cherry Goff, at the British Council, Turkey. I now would like to invite um, Consul General Judith Slater. Your Excellencies, will you kindly proceed, please, Madam? Thank you very much, everybody. Welcome to Para House. And thanks for the invitation to speak today at this very important launch event. On a personal note, it's great to welcome Cherry as the new British Council Turkey head. I look forward to working together with you on many more occasions on such exciting projects as this one. I'm always and always have been a very big fan of the British Council. I've worked with them in many countries around the world. I'm thinking in particular of India and indeed my last posting which was in Singapore. They always cheer me up when I'm having a bad day. They always make me feel as though my work contributes to something bigger. They're always on positive and um, important, but very po always positive projects. They're a force for good. Um, and this project, of course, is no exception to that. We, the British government's representatives in Turkey, are guests here, like the diplomats um, or cultural organizations of other countries too. We're the rolling stones, not gathering very much moss, if you like. We can't pretend fully to understand 
the motivations and drivers of other countries' peoples, though we often like to think we do. And that's why this Next Generation report, which reflects the views of young people in Turkey as Turkey undergoes a period of profound change, is so important. It will give us, the transient population, a window onto what young people who hold the keys to Turkey's future believe and what they aspire to achieve. I'm very grateful to the British Council and its next generation Turkey task force, research partners and experts for having the foresight and the courage to get out there and do this very thorough piece of research and analysis which will not only help us to understand more deeply what young people are thinking, but also to be able to plan our interventions accordingly. The events of the night of 15th of July last year continue to have deep resonance for people in Turkey, both old and young, but it's the youth of Turkey who will need to shape the new future. Despite the challenges which Turkey and its people are facing at the moment, there are many reasons for being optimistic, and a big one of these is the resilience of those young people in particular. I was very surprised to see that within days of the failed coup attempt, they were getting on with their jobs, their daily lives, their routines. There's also potential for Turkey to capitalize on the demographic dividend, but policymakers need to work swiftly and sensibly to do this. And it's important to remember that this is not just about getting young people into work. It's about recognizing the agency of the next generation. It's really important to listen to young people as the leaders, shapers, and global citizens of tomorrow, as their actions will shape the security and the prosperity agenda for Turkey and its neighbors. Young people in Turkey, as has already been said by Sherry, have much in common with their UK counterparts, which gives us a shared platform to build trust and understanding. For example, they seek a good quality education, secure employment, the opportunity to travel abroad, and to develop good relations with their neighborhoods and communities. And I'm delighted to see, as I look at the results of this report, such positive views of the UK amongst young people in Turkey. This is a testimony to the strength of the relationship between our two countries. There's much in the report, which you will find enlightening, I hope. I was struck by a quote in it from a 26-year-old young man who said, youth is a burning spark, but I didn't live my youth to the fullest. I grew up as soon as I came here, I started working straight after primary school and I've worked ever since. He seems to be telling others to seize the day or carpe diem, as the saying goes. Another 26-year-old, this time a woman, spoke in a similar vein. She said, to be young is to live life to the full, to have fun. This is my advice for young people. Do whatever you want to do. Don't dive into adult life too quickly. Don't be quick to get married or to have a job. There is nothing like youth. There's also plenty in the report which can be valuable to policymakers about what youth expects from their governments, their bosses, and their families those who govern and influence their lives. They want inclusive access to educations in all forms. They want to be empowered to be independent and active participants in their society. And they want that society to be supportive and inclusive with tolerance and respect for all young people. Many of the challenges Turkey faces in these areas are the same as we share in the UK. So there's so much to learn from each other's experiences and challenges. For example, in integrating refugee communities, protecting the rights of women and girls, and promoting community cohesion. Turkey is justifiably proud of the way it has absorbed close to three million Syrian refugees, for example, with very little visible unrest and a huge amount of misafir pever, or hospitality and tolerance. The UK is also proud of its role here, and particularly the distinctive contribution the British Council plays through its cultural relations approach in fostering dialogue and collaborative action. I trust that this report will prompt further discussion and provide an informed platform for young people to join in dialogue with those who govern and influence their lives. Finally, Along with thanking the Next Generation Task Force, I would also like to thank especially the young people who participated for opening up their lives and providing an insight into their world. 
We trust this report will prompt this discussion and we look forward to the UK continuing to be a trusted partner for Turkey. Thank you very much indeed and enjoy the conversation today. I'm sure you will. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Madam Council General, Judith Slater, we thank you very much. We had two different talks this afternoon already, telling us a great deal about the fundamentals of the research, the mission, and also giving us already hints and clues as to what the findings may be. Just to recap once again, one of the overriding purposes of this piece of research was to understand the voice of the youth segment and make them more um, comprehensive. Let's find out immediately what it's all about. We're going to listen to four different youngsters. The survey took a year and a half, and they're going to be here to tell us um, their interpretation. We then will proceed with the presentation and further um, elaboration. Lise mezunuyum. Çocuk gelişimi bitirdim. Çok fazla bir iş olanağı yok şu an. 25 yaşındayım. Doğma büyüme İstanbulluyum. Özel bir işletmede insan kaynakları departmanında çalışıyorum. İstanbul'da üniversite okuyorum. Son sınıf öğrencisiyim. Ailem Ankara'da yaşıyor. Trabzon'dan göç ettik buraya. Burada da gerekli o eğitim alamadık. Pek iş bulamıyorum. Yani okumak istedim. Fakat hem okuyup hem çalışma ihtimalim yoktu. Aile konusunda hiçbir maddi destek görmediğim için. Demokratik bir ailem var, çok şükür. Yani ben İstanbul'a gelmek istediğimi söyledim. Ee, orada kalmamı istediler. Fakat e, benim hayallerim, isteklerim İstanbul'da yaşamak doğrultusundaydı. Yani bu anlamda e, iki yıla yakın bir ailemi ikna etme sürecim oldu. İnşaatlarda çalışıyorum, baba mesleği. İşte iş olduğu zaman çalışıyorum ama Hep o eksiklik var yani bir yerde bir memur olamamanın eksikliği ve önümü görememenin eksikliği hep var hayatımda. Yani öyle bir çatışmamız yok aile. Yani olsa da bunları çözebiliyoruz. Demokratik bir aile izleyebilirim. Anlaşamadığımız durumlarda bu konuyu göz ardı ediyoruz. E, genellikle de burada Ailenin olduğu olabilir belki. Hani farkında olmasam bile ailenin istekleri olabilir. Üniversiteyi bitiremedikten sonra bir İngilizce kursuna yazıldım. Dışarıdan hani en azından bir İngilizce öğrenmiş olayım diye. KPSS diye bir sınav koyuyorsunuz. Yeterli bir puan aldığımı düşünüyorum. Mülakat koyuyorsunuz. Oradan eğiliyorsunuz. Yani biraz adaletli bir ülke olsa aslında. Hani biraz daha adalet. Her şey güzel yoksa. Okay, so you've already seen it in the video. So more than 2,500 um, youngsters attended the survey. You've only just met them, Gizem, Ayla, Leila and Ibrahim are the names. And throughout the panel, they're going to be here around um, to narrate and to tell us about their dreams, expectations and aspirations. And we're here to communicate that. Next Generation is done by British Council Turkey um, and it's supported by Yada. Um, the Future is Brighter um, Foundation. It's between 18 to 30 year olds in terms of respondents. We've got Ulaş Tulu from the Yada team. If you would kindly proceed to the stage. Thank you for coming. 
good afternoon. You have a presentation, don't you? You've got lots of pie charts and numbers to present. Already have started, haven't we? Right, so take us from the very beginning to the very end, because you've, brought, you've been involved from the start to the very end. So because I'm a reporter, I'd like, to, I'm, and I'm rather curious. When you first started off, you had expectations, and as a result, you obtained a great deal of information. My question is, what surprised you the most? What made you say, "Oh my gosh"? Um, what, like, what would be the mantra? Researchers don't quite like a mantra. You tell me, and I'll find the mantra. It's not what took me personally by surprise, but while sort of addressing the survey, while we said the subject is about future plans of youngsters, people say to us, do they have plans? Did you ask them? Do they really have a plan? I think this is delusional. Um, so discovering that this is a delusion because the young segment have a great deal of plans for the future. They've got different contingencies, plan A, if not plan B or plan C. And interestingly enough, um, the, the families in the center of any some any form of future planning. They want to be emancipated, become independent, but they also want a family of their own. In other words, the reality is, in order to become independent from their mums and dads, they want to marry and set up a family of their own. Right, um, let's go through it from here. There we go. So you have the microphone. Good afternoon. Hello. We're here this afternoon, not necessarily to present data, but the outcomes, the conclusion from the survey. You've got the report in front of you, which contains a great depth of data. Afterwards, or later down the road, um, we, we may sort of go into further length with regards to data. The fundamental data is the following, but rather what's our interpretation? What are the results? The next generation is by British Council. It's a global and international survey or series of um, research conducted by British Gen Council across multiple jurisdictions worldwide about youth, future dreams and concerns issues um, of youngsters. Um, Pakistan, Tanzania, Bangladesh, Nigeria, um, the Ukraine, um, the UK are some of the other countries where it was previously conducted and, and then it happened here in Turkey. The overriding topic are the dreams and concerns of youngsters, but then again, all countries around their own specific design, conducting their own research, and um, all about sort of communicating the results to policymakers or influencers in the society. So that's how we set off. It's not a, exactly a year and a half ago. It actually took one year. And this is the field. There was a design. We went out the, on the field on the 1st of March. There was a qualitative and a quantitative aspect. There was sampling to make sure that it's a proper sample representing the country and um, sort of structured in a way to represent the country as much as possible, um, setting quotas on the um, on the 18th, from the 18th to the 23rd of um, April, we went through um, the quantitative element, and then we moved on to the qualitative part of the survey. So um, there were like lots and lots of findings that c comes out of the quantitative element. And we're trying to add meaning or interpret the outcomes. The, the profile, just to interpret the profile of the people that we went to, um, here they are before we proceed with the results. Youngsters and the youth. Speaking of which, you think of um, like students, students at school, by and large students at university. Um, but there's one thing that we notice and that, um, that their profile tends to be rather diverse. They don't have to be students alone. And you've got results from this survey which demonstrates that 35% of the youngsters are actually students, 39% approximately um, are full-time, and um, more or less also 3% or so are part-time, so they're already part of the workforce. You've got 11% who are unemployed and 6% who are not in active search of a job. And by the way, um, we keep saying that the demographics are very young in Turkey, but here's another fact, we're aging rapidly, but still, we've got quite a substantial population who are young. 16 million are 18 to 30 year olds altogether. It's a big number. Speaking of which, um, even if the percentage 
is a little, it's quite a big number, like even 1%, that would actually make up 165,000 people. In other words, um, it may seem to be small in, small in terms of proportion, but the numbers speak for themselves. You think only 12% of the youngsters are jobless, which you think is quite modest, but then again, numerically, that's worth 2 million youngsters, which is a hefty amount, or which um, which gives you a totally different perspective. There you go. Don't just pay attention to the percentages. Numerically, it's quite a big group. You've got to pay attention to every single breakdown when you're dealing with youngsters. Um, once again, these are some of the primary findings that I'd like to take you through this afternoon. However, though, um, just to note, just to sort of um, give you a framework overall, uh, frequently when youngsters talk, the cliche is the youngsters are our future. The youth segment make up our, make our future. Um, the youth is somewhat a f um, project and youngsters are instrumental. However, notwithstanding, we'd like to deliberate today, um, trying to understand how youngsters feel today, maybe about the future, ultimately, but we'd like to find out more about youngsters at the moment. Um, in other words, what are some of the things that they dream about, what they engage with today to build their own future, and the opportunities or the challenges that they have? There are two headings that are first and foremost. One is to be empowered which is key. So for the future, uh, for youngsters to be able to build their own future, like what sort of things do they do to feel more empowered? What are some of the um, opportunities and resources that they have at their disposal? And the number two is decision making. Because this is about the future, every single plan or contemplation about the future is to do with decision making or factors that feed into their decision making. So we'd like to find out how they're positioned while sort of addressing challenges, concerns for their future. Um, furthermore, sort of decision making and um, empowerment. This isn't merely about youngsters. Obviously, you've got the powerful or authority group um, who are the current decision makers. They don't just have future challenges and concerns, but the authority likewise have sort of aspirations, dreams and concerns, vice versa. So it may be conflicting from time to time, although it may also be in tandem. So you've got the authority and also the future sort of running into conflict, but also um, in great sort of concordance in terms of views and expectations from time to time. So that's the one thing that comes out um, again you've got sort of um, youngsters who've got their own dreams and aspirations, but um, self-realization, sort of becoming, um, gaining independence, being independent from their families. Yes, there are a set of dreams and ideals pertaining to that, but from time to time, you've got family number one, another areas of authority, whose expectations may be um, conflicting. If and when there's contesting expectation, and if they believe that the outcome may be disagreement, um, youngsters like to be, become compliant rather than disagree any further. So they may be in disagreement from time to time, but even in a situation where they disagree, they like to comply, they like to act in compliance with authority, um, be that their family or or anyone else. So. It's, it's like spiritually they may be compliant, whereas um, spiritually not so compliant, but physically they do comply. Um, so they become subservient as a means of coping. So be it like the social circles, especially their counterparts and their friends, that they, um, they like to avoid areas of tension or tense topics. And there's always like um, reconciling views and ideas that they like to socialize upon. Um, the most sort of dangerous area would be politics. And the automatic reflex for them would be to avoid areas of political tension while they uh, mingle from a social perspective. Empowerment or feeling stronger, more powerful is one topic. And obviously, that's to do with education. The cliche is still that education is a must. Youngsters, as far as their future is concerned, 
They believe that education is the strongest instrument that makes them feel powerful, but they're not fully 100% happy with education. You talk to different segments, and this was like great big diversity, and they're not happy with the way education is provided. It's still a very hot topic in Turkey. That being the case, there are two different precautions. One is to get education abroad, and number two is personal ties and connections. So add networking and personal connections. Um, obviously, it's not just education, but it's also connections that seems to be playing a pivotal role. The survey points at one more thing, which is gender issues. So notwithstanding, notwithstanding gender may be, as far as how they feel about gender, um, is sort of one area where they've outperformed the rest of the society, but gender remains an important topic. Um, because like women compared to men, um, they still believe that they they run into disadvantages, such as um, the proportion of need is comparing men and women. In other words, as far as employment or education is concerned, if they're deprived of jobs or education, um, women without education and without employment is at 36% versus 56%, which is twice as big as um men. So the next is web and the internet. The internet is where, relatively speaking, they're far more comfortable, more confident and far more knowledgeable compared to their senior elderly counterparts. But they use the internet as a means of socializing more than anything else. Um, rather than engaging in productive activity, they like to use the web to socialize. As far as technology is concerned, they still don't believe that they know um, well enough about the web as far as technology is concerned. There's one more outcome that was already mentioned during the introduction, and that is youngsters are positive about the future. So as far as Turkey's um, future, they may be a bit negative or miserable, but in spite of all the adversity, as far as their own futures are concerned, they certainly believe that there's room for positivity, and they believe that the future will be uh, more positive for them. So let's go into further detail, shall we? Right, the family plays a key role, and so much so that the family, again, is crucial as far as empowerment is concerned. The family is seen to support them, but the family is also deemed to be too strict. In other words, um, youngsters are obviously dependable on their family, that's clear. They depend on their family and they're dependable. In other words, emotionally speaking, um, do they want detachment? No, that's not the purpose, to sort of disconnect them emotionally. But while sort of um, planning f for the future, they believe that family support is central. They want their families to support them intangibly, but also tangibly for their future. So for this reason, from time to time, the expectations of the family do not coincide with the expectations of the youngsters, and this may be actually a need for um, pressure. Um, even, even the youngsters are employed, they don't leave their families. Taking a look at it, you see that 73% of uh, them still live um, with their families, so only with the um, with the reason of marriage, um, youngsters leave their home. We will, we will uh, see it in a few uh, more slides that marriage is seen as a way to rescue themselves or living in a different city or even in another country. These are presented as legitimate reasons for living apart from families. If they are able to have a means and if they are able to earn their living uh, and live in the same city, this is not uh, common. On the contrary, it causes tension between the youngster and the family. As for the daily life, this is related to the daily life relationship. Socialization is uh, key, as I said before. On the internet, they spend time to socialize. That's more on the forefront. We have heard expressions such as "I'm extremely social." The moment I go to, uh, oh, the moment I go back home, I go into internet. There were young people saying that. So there is a new definition of socialization. And as for 
socialization with family, that's sharing. Uh, watching TV is still an important dynamic. This is more than two hours, so 39% of them watch television. Only 10% of them said that they don't watch TV at all. There is another transformation. Uh, watching TV is seen as the foundation to spend time with the family. The same thing has started with adults. But especially for the young people, um, this is like a side activity uh, in addition to spending time with family. In addition to that, doing sports and um, attending cultural activities, this is quite low. For sports, it's 19% for less than two hours. And for arts and um, cultural activities, it's 13%. Um, Seventy percent of young people stay away from arts and cultural activities and uh, 80 percent of them do not uh, exercise. So there seems to be an access of socialization in their daily life. Uh, I had already mentioned uh, education and training. Yes, they still continue with the motto that training and education is a must. But when they say education is a must, uh, there used to be a trust and confidence in education in that paradigm, meaning that would be used to leverage capacity. But nowadays, uh, it is seen as a diploma in the form of a diploma. So access to information is not a problem at all, but in, uh, further enhancement of capacity. They believe that they are self-confident and they believe that they may enhance their capacity from outside the school. And these are the um, um, these are uh, the scores that they give, and uh, the criticism is quite harsh. And this is out of ten that they score. So when that is the case, going abroad seems to be a great opportunity. 50% of the youngsters would like to continue their studies abroad. These are, well, there are some who have uh, quite low uh, um, probability of going abroad. And living abroad uh, seems to be quite popular. So from all sectors of the society, people are included in that. Uh, People used to be more um, against the West, and uh, we would in the past say that there would be less interest shown in living abroad. But these days, we see that in nearly in all sectors of the society and in all circles of young people, um, they are interested in uh, living abroad, having their further studies abroad. Uh, with United States uh, coming first and then the UK, Germany and other European countries. This is for better education, better job opportunities, for more freedoms, liberties and better lifestyles. This accompanies the perception. Co in order to avoid these uh, conflicting situations, young people are uh, being harmonious. They are acting in a harmonious manner by staying at home or staying away from home. Staying away from home, there are two headings that legitimize that. One is living abroad, the other one is marriage, getting married. As a, as a footnote, I'd like to mention one thing that was also mentioned in one of the videos that's quite surprising. English seems to be a common problem for all young people. Um, this is no longer the problem of uh, a group of young people that would spend a um, significant amount of money for their studies. It's a common problem for all young people in their day-to-day -day life as they use technology, as they use internet. They seem to see inter um, They seem to see English uh, literacy as um, as a key to that. Another finding I'd like to mention is that. The number one hurdle for the future plans is low participation in decision-making process. It's not only limited to families, but in civil society, in um, membership to uh, political parties, and also um, we see that uh, this is 5% for uh, membership to parties and 5%, nearly 5% to NGO membership. If we include some others, it is even higher.
it's not a low uh, percentage at all. But when you take a look at the participation, you see that participation is seen as or, um, as ornamental. It's not really in depth. So this is also seen. Uh, well, there has been differentiation in certain parts of the society, especially when we t uh, think about the macro political uh, institutions. One is EU membership. When compared with the rest of the society, young people seem to be more positive and optimistic about EU membership. And especially when we think about the political agenda of the time we conducted this survey, only 39% said no to EU membership. That's quite interesting. And also for gender uh, equality, social gender equality, um, only 28% uh, were uh, against the equality concept. Avoiding avoiding this, these conflicts and trying to balance these, one of the things that young people do in order to avoid these is to keep quiet. I don't like I don't like tension at all. If I feel that tension is up and coming, I just avoid that place. I just go away from that place. This is an expression that we heard many times from young people. But if it's something that is owned by many and if they believe there is consensus, then they raise their voices. One to mention is Syrian refugees. For Syrian refugees, when it comes to that, they unfortunately have strong prejudices. Of course, this also is, um, is seen as a threat to their employment and their social um, conditions. They also have prejudices that they are more into uh, crime. Young people have such prejudices, so they also express some of their prejudices. So when it comes to um, compliance or harmonization, that is one of the emerging topics. Um, there is also low contact with uh, LGBT um, individuals as well as non-Muslims, but a significant amount of young people also are uh, more lenient about um, LGBT these days. So prejudices seem to be um, reduced, but still they'd like to avoid them as much as possible. As for the empowerment of young people, I'd like to mention uh, some of the topics before I uh, round up my presentation. When we take a look at the data that we have and other resources as well, we see that the resources are uh, scarce and limited. When that's the case, we um, do not see strong, robust, inclusive, and effective support systems. So empowerment uh, seems to be associated with other factors. One is social gender equality, so being a man and a woman uh, seems to be a determinant. Urbanization or coming from the rural uh, is still a determining factor. Support of the family, I already mentioned. Uh, education, uh, that also was mentioned. Uh, belonging and identity, belonging to a circle. And also some uh, some skills and capabilities uh, from birth or nurtured afterwards uh, seem to be important factors as well. And all of these factors, when thought, uh, thought along with the targets and objectives of the young people, form some abstract groups. One is uh, forming a privileged uh, group and this may be seen as a caste system with three different levels. There is the privileged, there is another group which is not privileged, but with the networks and with the social um, environs and with the social connections that they have, they uh, see uh, a capacity to empower themselves. And there is also a third group which uh, does not have this uh, these means at all. So these three groups are quite strict groups, so it's like a caste system. There's hardly any transition from one to another. And uh, we see that gender, again, is a determining factor. So if I am to um, draw a conclusion, I'd like to say the following. They feel themselves, young people feel themselves excluded from the decision-making process. That's an important issue. They do have the desire to have a bright future. They also would like to liberalize themselves. However, they have limited 
limited connections with the decision makers and as they establish these connections and links, uh, they do not act in accordance with their tendencies but they mostly go for uh, compliance because they uh, believe that family, politics and the business world expect uh, strict loyalty from young people because these um, values and principles are based on patriarchal values. Uh, I also would like to refer to the details that go beyond the generalization. There are generalizations, but if you ask me what the similarities and differences were, daily life likes and uh, values seem to be quite uh, compliant. Fem uh, I can say that daily life, participation in daily life, their likes and their cultural values uh, seem to be quite uh, alike. These identities are um, differentiated and they go different uh, directions when it comes to um, politics, especially when it comes to a uh, future perspective. I would say one uh, topic that emerges is uh, unemployment. Um, another one to mention is ethnic uh, identities and different um, identities being a reason for going different ways. Europe, Turkey, perspective towards Europe, perspective towards uh, Turkey uh, were affected from that. So in uh, a nutshell, these are our findings. Of course, further details may be found in our report and I'm ready and available for your questions if you have any. Thank you. So we'll listen to Dr. Urash, uh, Ulash from Yada. Thank you very much for your uh, contribution. There are so many things that will be highlighted throughout today's program. One thing um, that I should mention is uh, what Dr. Ulash said. Yes, of course, uh, future will come, but we also discussed that corresponding elements for the future. So what else have the youngsters uttered um, as they attempted to express themselves? So let's watch our next video and let's hear from them which words are uh, recorded in our video. And then we'll start with our panel discussion. Genellikle evdeyim. Çok fazla dışarı çıkan birisi değil. Silmesi, süpürmesi, mutfağı temizlemesi, banyoyu temizlemesi, ütüsü, çamaşırı. İşten arta kalan zamanlarda arkadaşlarımla zaman geçiririm. Sinema, mekanlarda bir araya gelip eğleniriz, konuşuruz, toplanırız, bir şeyler yaparız. Yani takılırız açıkçası. Hayatım var. Okul veya diğer hobilerime çok vakit ayırıyorum. Ee, arkadaşlarımla birlikte dışarıda görüşüyoruz, ev ortamında görüşüyoruz. Gündelik hayatım açıkçası yani ev ve iş arası oluyor. Pek sosyal bir hayatım yok. Sinema ve en son onu bile hatırlamıyorum yani ev iş. Belki birkaç gün kahvelerde arkadaşlar oturup bir okey bir tavla oynayabiliyoruz belki. Çünkü İstanbul zor bir çay içsen 2 lira, 3 lira bana istiyorlar. Evde olduğum için genellikle sosyal medyadayım. Genellikle Instagram'dayım ve sürekli işte el işi yapılabilecek şeyleri takip ediyorum. Sosyal medyayı e, Instagram'ı kullanıyorum, Facebook'u kullanıyorum. Bunları da pek e, aktif olarak kullanmıyorum. Sadece pasif olarak daha çok takip eden bir insanım. Sosyal medyayla aram iyi. E, tüm sosyal medya hesaplarını aktif olarak kullanıyorum. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter gibi. E, burada benim bir özgürleşme alanım olarak düşünüyorum. Kimlikleri açısından da birçok farklı görüşlenen arkadaşlarım var. Ya yani Bu siyasi farklılıklar olabilir. Çoğu etrafımdaki insanlar Karadenizli ama 2-3 e, tane Kürt arkadaşım var. Yani sonuç olarak onlar da insan. Bu zaten tartışmaların çoğu da herhalde siyasetten kaynaklanıyor, bu söylemlerden kaynaklanıyor. Ya bunları da gündeme getirmemeye çalışıyoruz. Ya yani sorunları daha çok öne çıkarmaktansa daha uzlaşıyı öne çıkarmak daha sağlıklı oluyor insani ilişkilerde. Bir tane arkadaşım var öyle, çok farklı düşünür. 
Arkadaş ortamında farklı anlaşamadığımız konuları konuşmamayı tercih ediyoruz. Çünkü kendi aramızda hani bu sefer çatışma yaşıyoruz. Bu yüzden hiç açılmaz konusu bizde görüşleri. Liseden arkadaşlarım var, liseyi burada okudum. Genelde görüşlerimiz uyar ama uyumadığı zamanlar tabii ki oluyor. Çözülmeyecek gibiyse yani öyle illaki oluyor. Hani sohbeti ben orada keselim çünkü daha ileri konu değiştirme. So from time to time we will continue uh, lending an ear to these young friends of ours as young people uh, dream about their future and plan their future and as they prepare themselves to be independent adults for life what are the hurdles and what are the support mechanisms that they are faced with so we are going to try to find an answer to this question um, during our panel discussion enablers and barriers is the title of our panel discussion let me invite our moderator founder at yada Mehmet Ali Çalışkan thank you very much and uh, he is from the Yada team and let me now invite our panelists we have Batuhan Aydagül from Education Reform Initiative we have Reçel Blok co-founder Rümeysa Çamdereli and we have Hansen Doğan from UNDP and Mr. Çalışkan the floor is yours thank you very much welcome all welcome as our panelists i also would like to welcome you can we have you a little bit to the front so that i can see you easily so as uh, dr ulash conducted this research and referred to the results of this research there are a couple of elements that we have to deepen as we discuss the matter here one of the points that attracted our attention and uh, one of the topics i would like to focus on uh, is going to be the main theme of our panel discussion and with each and every panelist I'd like to go into the details of these uh, elements before we start our discussion maybe it's better to draw a framework as this research showed us and many other discussions also show us the following in Turkey young people seem to be um, in some kind of attention in their social uh, surrounding economical life in their family life the subjects of these uh, lives have certain uh, requests and demands from uh, them and they have a plan for them and young people have also a plan for themselves to manage their own destiny and they seem to be having a different uh, vision so that seems to be the contradiction families and communities politics and society and the economy have different expectations from young people other than their own expectations so in response to these expectations young people are developing and creating a vision for themselves but they avoid tension they try to comply with that this is the reason why we say they comply although they don't um, present any willingness so this has actually links with a couple of things like support mechanisms to be confronted with the support mechanisms social gender equality is an issue and is a distinguishing factor that we see which is quite significant education again is a part of this framework so this is the reason why uh, we have Hansen Doan from UNDP um, who is in charge of development plans and he has long experience with young people so is it tension or is it compliance would like to discuss that with you Mr. Doan and Batuhan also works on education programs and education policies he also is having tremendous um, experience in that he's coming from education reform initiative that's why we'd like to share and uh, discuss that bit with Mr. Aydegül and for Rumeysa Rumeysa is an editor and co-founder at Reçel Blok and this is a significant uh, female experience we are witnessing there 
um, Turkish uh, problems in Turkey and um, problems related to the society are being discussed on her blog. So let me start with you, Mr. Doan. Even though we uh, are seated in a different row, I'd like to start with you, Hansen. So both in the research and also in the presentation, we define this concept as a tension. And when you think about the contradiction or the tension between the young people and others, do you think this is tension or is it a strategy to um, to hold on to? And do you think this is a unique picture um, which uh, depicts today's young people? Thank you. Tension, rather than uh, rather than the tension, I think harmonization and compliance seems to be more on the forefront. That's what I detected from the um, interviews, and I also would like to, and I also had the optimistic approach. Maybe that also had a share. For instance, I'm not able to uh, spend time for sports. So when I see that young people, 70 percent of the time, do not uh, allocate time for sports, then I'm relieved. Although this is a social Social issue. Well, uh, think about thinking about it. Um, young people and education is not the name of our ministry. Our ministry has the following name: Ministry of Young People and uh, Sports. Uh, however, it's quite um, interesting and significant that young people are so uh, far away from sports. I am the. Uh, Point, I'm the point of contact or uh, contact person at uh, UNDP. You may think that's something different, but it is actually closely linked. Both the private sector and young people have always been the um, leaders of change. This has always been the case. And the young people in the Republic of Turkey, since from the establishment of the Republic, uh, have always been in such an effort. That's what we see. Uh, since from those uh, men uh, that uh, were worth uh, 40 liras, that was an expression, since from those times, uh, young people have always been in an effort uh, for change. I think with my optimistic view and uh, with my perspective on this report, I think young people are putting compliance and harmonization more on the forefront. When I said this uh, man uh, worth of 40 liras, not all of you would know the story. Let me tell you what this uh, story was about. And it was right on this uh, street. Back in the past, the um, tram operating uh, company and young people had an issue between themselves. Young people wanted to have reduced tariffs for themselves, uh, student fee. And 40 liras back then, uh, that was actually a currency. It was like uh, um, a little bit smaller than a penny or kurush. Uh, the actual fee was 80 liras. So they organized among themselves, young people. They started protesting. They would just tear the uh, ticket um, and only throw one uh, part of the ticket into the into the box uh, that was in a way a uh, protest uh, that was in history one of the initial protests in uh, our past uh, however unfortunately it ended up with uh, clashes and uh, violence tram operator the tram operator also uh, had an international identity and based on that they is sought for their rights however it ended up uh, with Violence. So that uh, effort actually brought along this uh, concept, man worth of 40 uh, liras. That's actually to humiliate. They say, you know, that's a guy uh, worth of 40 um, TL, be 40 kurush, or, you know, that's a guy uh, worth a penny. So that is in a way to humiliate the um, efforts of the young people, but that's also referring to the effort of young people for change. However, that uh, effort is not internalized. Just on the contrary, the society stands against this and puts that aside. So uh, as I was a young um, guy in the 80s and a little child in 70s, this contradiction always uh, 
was on the forefront. Young people wanted to be a part of the change. They always uh, wanted to express themselves and their willingness for change according to the conditions of those times. Unfortunately, this has always caused contradiction and this has always caused problems. So this research, the results of this research shows us that this is what nurtures our, uh, nurtures my optimism. Society seems to have embraced this uh, request for change. So when uh, the society opened its arms and um, embraced this uh, idea, young people uh, started expressing their request for change in a more favorable way. I think this is the most striking uh, emphasis. Uh, do you think that this has transformed the families as well? Yes. Families are now trying to establish a stronger dialogue and a more robust uh, dialogue uh, when they see this transformation. They try to see uh, how this will empower the society. They are in an effort to better understand the young people and they no longer resist. So this has been quite an optimistic uh, perspective on the research. So rather than um, rather than attention, you're saying this is a process transforming the family as well as the youngsters. This is your interpretation. Well, it would be good to make a comparative analysis because when you take a look at other societies, individualization uh, seems to be the outcome. However, this research shows that there is no hard, uh, there is no um, there is no effort for individualization. This is embedded with the society still. So another dimension is that there are other sh subjects that um, families interact with families and I'm sure you are uh, seeing other uh, experiences at the development programs. That's Let's leave it uh, for the second round. So let me now come to you, Batuan. Uh, let me ask you the following. As far as we can see from the research, when we take a look at the educational perspective, we see that just like it was the case in this tension and compliance, young people are not satisfied with the education, with the current educational system, and they are suspicious about uh, um, uh, about the fulfillment of the system. But then again, they see diplomas as, uh, as an obligation. This is actually actually a request um, to have a diploma because they think that uh, rather than going through an education program of good quality, it is through a diploma that they will have a good network and a good job. So that seems to be another strategy for holding on. So do you think that's uh, that's in a way uh, what young people do to take a position? Thank you very much, Mehmet Ali. I also would like to express my gratitude to British Council for conducting this research both in uh, the rest of the world as well as in Turkey. Thank you very much for um, including Turkey. Well, we have to see education as a vehicle, as a tool. Education is a journey and it may take you to different routes and to different stops. And on the one hand, when you take a look at it, uh, I will uh, carry on where Hansen left from. Indeed, there seems to be um, youngsters in Turkey that are quite uh, close to their families and they seem to be dependent on their uh, loyal uh, to their families. They see um, they see their households as home where they are where they get together. That actually gives me warm feelings in my heart. But at the same time, they seem to be dependent. I also wrote that in a report. I had attended a conference at the Foundation University, and someone greeted me at the door to take me to the conference. A whole. Uh, this was a student studying uh, electronics, um, electronic engineering. Are you enjoying it? I asked, and then he just uh, smiled. Who are you? Um, who are you studying this department for? Um, I asked, and he said, I always wanted to be a pilot, but I'm studying for uh, my father's sake. So why haven't you attended that school? And he said that. My father asked me uh, whether I would like to spend uh, my whole life in a small uh, cockpit. And then someone else told me that, well, it's the father affording all the uh, education and the studies. So if young people are going to study for the sake of their families, and if this uh, these studies um, are not always um, provided by the state, 
So it's quite normal that young people are uh, rather um, reluctant to go through this or are not really enthusiastic or thrilled about um, this current system. Statistics also show that if the system works for some people, then those people trust in the system more. But if the system is not in their favor, then their trust and confidence in the system is lower. Still, the happening in terms of informal. Um, the debate around education is more or less to center around like um, state education, right? But we'd like to perhaps go um, step a bit further. I'd like to turn to Rumesa and ask her the following question. The survey tells us that there are risks, opportunities, and threats, right, facing the youth segment. There are opportunities, but there are also exposures. But um, how do they benefit, and how do they? Th they're not saying there's equality. They talk about inequality with regards to access to opportunity and threats. And one of them says. Um, they said is gender. They said that um, it's a matter of whether you're a man or woman. They can't access um, the jobs market or education um, equally. They said for women, um, it seems to be a, a bigger issue. Where, um, but the one thing that they have in common is they want to, a family, but they believe and they imagine that their families will be brighter and better than the families they come from. How do you feel about the inequality that they often talk about? And here's another um, question, not based on interpretation per se, but like how about women in your blog, um, in, the, in the jam blog, in the marmalade blog, how about their perspectives? And what other sort of um, hints and tips would you would you get would you like to share with us? I looked at the survey, the outcomes, and I've sort of um, consulted my young my um, family and friends. And this whole thing about marriage, how they believe marriage is um, is the road to freedom and savior. It's fearful, as as a female activist. As someone who defines herself as a feminist, I think this is brutal. It's a major impediment. It's got feminist ramifications and also women's rights and freedoms. You often think you, you would want to start the sentence by saying, I'm actually against marriage, but um, I don't want to wed, but you still want official marriage. So we there's always that but that we can't somehow uh, disconnect from. The young generation, I'm part of it, I'm still in the 18 to 30 year old bracket, but it's t it, it is totally irrelevant and there's like a totally different method that has been designed. How it's, it's incredibly, um, for me, it's very, very miserable based on my experience too. Um, marriage can't be the road to savior. And if they do, then they run into challenges, problems once they marry in their own families. And it's going to suffocate them because they won't be able to share it with their loved ones or spouses. Interestingly, some women are rather creative, ingenious, much of it published at our blog. Like here, this may be the landscape, but in our blog, there's like Islamic discourse, conservative discourse, women who, s who try to strive against it. So the, the values that they attribute um, to marriage is completely different if they come from the more religious background. Rebellion against marriage, not wanting to marry, like is life without marriage possible? We've published so much and there was like rebellion. They were like saying women have to marry, women have got to give birth. And there's also a great deal around um, mate, um, not just matrimony, but also motherhood. Like 23, some suggest is the average age for marriage. And then it's also the decline for um, having um, the age at which women give birth is also evident. So there's a great big burden. And then women want away from it, quit altogether, becomes a um, vicious circle that they want to escape from, that we often see in our blog. So here's another pivotal point. Um, the blog accesses women who've got access to web, who are literate, and also accounting for like education. There's like a humongous um, portion who they may be men or women, m most of them women, by the way, 
they, they run into impediments with regards to the jobs market and care and nurture remains a, a problem it's it's not like um, preschool education is not just a problem for adults um, preschool education matters just as much here almost always associated with my own life it's a major agenda topic and it is also a major problem um, against women entering the labor market because of lack of preschool education so like um, it's not just adult women or just like a certain segment of the population we need like um, preschool care obviously okay so you're saying it needs to spread it needs to gain depth and it also needs to turn to dialogue an inclusive dialogue um, across diverse segments this whole thing around marriage may i please add something i read the research back again and like the question was what do you do during the day how do you spend your day and all all sorts of activities like married couples are down at the bottom they spend time less outdoors they go, hardly ever go out to the movies and i read it and it felt so gloomy like being married meant total disconnection and then i said to myself why do they still aspire to marry but still like going abroad it becomes a likelihood right like there was this conservative woman in the sample and it is a fact women believe that their fathers won't let them go abroad but if they were to marry someone from a similar background they think they'll be able to travel overseas may sound strange but it's also a weird instrumentation to emancipation it's like a legitimate way out of the house it's also like maybe um building a common future with another man so it's like um relocating from autocracy to democracy if you were to compare the lifestyles in either home so let's go ahead to the second round and let's talk about how to overcome it so now that you've entered it right you've already mentioned how um there could be like transition between issues um and between different profiles how can we reinforce it and how can we turn it into a source for empowerment hansen i'd like to turn to you once again and ask you lack of equality um gender it looks as if there's like inequality in terms of access to opportunity and also ability to overcome challenges now that you've had so much experience with private businesses and development scheme how do private businesses feel um is there a difference at all on the part of the private business um so if if there's somewhat of a transformation with regards to the family we may be viewing transformation in other domains how are policies right there there and then uh, with a view towards maybe empathizing more with the youth that's my question um the private sector puts a great deal of emphasis on the youth segment both as consumers and as prospective um, employees companies do similar pieces of research continuously they value it they appreciate it and they um they strive to improve their corporate policy along the results from survey so um i am sure that private businesses will access the survey and they'll take it very very seriously however though um yes they want to improve their internal processes but they always need external support that know how doesn't happen internally altogether they always need external support so maybe this is one of the fruits from the report that the report could enable external mechanisms to help businesses improve their own internal um procedures in terms of jobs creation private businesses need the youth segment um with regards to participation and they do their best to attract the biggest talent private businesses we're now living in a global marketplace and here's a problem where accessing talent and qualified labor becomes more of a challenge companies that thrive that are doing well often hear about investing in talent but they can't often attract the talent that they truly want 
So that being a problem, you then have individuals who don't want to work for lousy businesses. So um, it's more like a give and take. Why? Because because like because they've discovered their own internal capacity. It's a moment of truth and wanting to practice it. Youngsters now appreciate that they can become entrepreneurs, set up their own businesses. They've seen others do it. They've had role models. So that's what they want. They want to be running their own business. That's what they would really, really want. Um, the government supports it. Do the commit? Does the community support it? I agree a little bit with Batuan. I think there's also more of a hybrid approach. The report doesn't tell us exactly how um, or if that's really the case. But the family does want their kids to take care of them eventually. And if, if, and if they're good at it, the families could think, well, why not? Why not? They could set up their own businesses so long as they can take care of me down the road. So the public sector um, supports entrepreneurial um, initiative. The economy is another beneficiary because it brings about a far more inclusive um, ec economic model. It also brings about a business model that caters to local needs and requirements, not necessarily profit, but a business model that's much more about the value system. And the more it's known of it that way, then that becomes a role model for younger um, young adults um, who are like, who want to pursue a much more inclusive social business model. And I think the future is big. You've got the bigger conglomerates that merely pursue profit. They realize it. But it's going to take them a great deal of time to transform within. It's going to cost them a lot of money, and they won't be able to catch the trend. They think they do. They, th they communicate and pretend. Uh, but then you have a business set up by two individuals that grow in leaps and bounds. Conglomerates are more idle. Normally, they would buy them off, but they can't. Not so easily nowadays. Like the big fish can't eat the small fish so, so easy nowadays. Youngsters appreciate it. And the society um, likes to surf, surf on it. If there's enough innovation, and if the if innovation is right, and if the price point is right, and if you've got price um, products and services that delivered cater to a need, we'll see more of it. By the way, much more of it, like small businesses pick up. So I think the overall paradigm in the jobs market is about to change. Like conventionally, full-time employment is not no more the ultimate ideal like you might have um, collaboration maybe between small and big businesses um, from the perspective of the private businesses they have to if they can't attract the talent that they really want they need to think maybe I could collaborate with them right so um, the question is maybe employing third-party vendors or on-demand employment. So it's more like because they can't attract them full-time, they'd rather employ them on a demand basis or as a third-party vendor. The big conglomerates need to think, how can I collaborate and how can I still use that ecosystem? They can't afford to disconnect from, um, from that talent pool. Otherwise, they'd be jeopardizing their own business. Then you've talked about talent, the competent workforce. The privileged, remember the privileged group. Um, what about those who haven't got the skill set? You've still got quite an um, enormous portion. But which skill set? It's with technology and rampant globalization and lots and lots of other things. You've got some jobs disappearing, but brand new jobs appearing, brand new, brand new types of preoccupation. And you have an important portion who unfortunately can't access. But then again, it's up to the private sector, right? Because the private sector is, okay, if the fact is that you can't access, right? If you're underprivileged and you can't, or if the private business can't access talent, they can at least nurture talent, i.e. vocational training would be done through the public sector via public policy making. And there's always a shortage. And, and it's like the reality remains still not enough vocational graduates. And they come out of school, they're probably not good enough. 
because they haven't got all the fresh skills that private businesses need. So they need to come out there, private businesses, and be more vocal about the need. They can collaborate with um, vocational schools or uh, any school um, to make sure that the right skill set is, is taught. So you could have pr um, private businesses actually spearheading that movement to help fill the void. You're part of UNDP and other supranational bodies. Do you think they could play a role? I'm telling you our policy, like maybe we're not, we're still not that very optimistic with regards to the private sector, a bit more optimistic with regards to supranational. We're a supranational entity. We recommend policy and we also deliver um, technical support. We do that with a perspective because we believe that education and the private sector have got to join forces and we're there to support them. We've designed our own model. We've worked with the Gaziantep industry Chamber of Industry to help um, Syrian re young Syrian refugees to give them the skills. There you've got a great deal of collaboration between industry and the state. And there, there are loads and loads of um, other stories coming about. But on, let me turn to you. A similar question is what I have next. The question is, what if they can't access formal education? Or in a situation where formal education fails to deliver, um, what kind of expectations do we have with regards to future employment? Do you think that education is transforming or is there enough pressure? Jobs evolve. The jobs market is evolving. Ways of working evolve. The economy is evolving. Education falling behind appallingly. And so, just to go back to the previous discussion, I think instruction and education have got to be dealt with. Let's call it like um, public education versus private, or um, here we are in a situation where we believe that it's all to be done by schools. But then you have an education failing to instruct, and how can it educate and instruct um, ideally? They probably won't be able to do either um, sufficiently. So um, you've got like a system that scores a five out of a 10. So, and we need to question. Um, and I think for some time, you've got schools, you've got education, instruction. No more is it about these three. You've got to address skills. Like there was a um, visual arts museum in Coventry, um, in Coventry Circle, and they they gave out certificates to underprivileged children having completed a course of training um, on visual arts and painting. And you can't imagine how thrilled you've got a museum giving out certificates to kids from poor backgrounds, and they feel ever so empowered. It gets rid of social stigma especially in a place where vocational schools are failing. Even if you were to work on them for another four decades, it probably won't be sufficient. So why are we still persisting that we need to overhaul um, vocational schools or schools in general and not somehow seek a third recourse? The it's, topics are fine, but how, how should we be approaching these topics? It's crystal clear. Every time you're dealing with a youth segment, um, social policies, education, or um, economic policies are not going to be good enough to resolve um, youngsters' solutions. You've got to instrument social policy and public policy and everything else. So you need to be juggling all three. Otherwise, it becomes a hodgepodge. And then, um, and then, and then, if you can't collaborate with public bus private businesses, you run into other issues. You've got the Ministry of National Education and the Turkish Assembly of Chambers and Exchanges were running um, a vocational school program. They um, it, and it became a certification program for jobless youngsters. They were also appointed to jobs in industry, but they didn't like minimum wage. Instead. They wanted to, they became security officers working for a shopping center. They didn't want an industry-related job. Is that outstanding? No. Vocational schools are not going to become a savior. 
education can't become a savior because the world has changed. We add, we expect too much from education. So let's contemplate all together to create that cross fertility. It's like um, the Ministry of Development runs another five year development program for private, for um, specialty. On the 21st and 22nd of December, there's going to be one on um, youth and children. This report must go there, and it's got to be deliberate today. Hansen, you do that. I will, because I'm part of that working group. And it says they're damping, damping a US um, academic in drive, right? Talks about driving. He says successful people have three different um, autonomy, specialty, and meaning or relevance. He says these are skills that they've got or um, peculiarities or um, features that they have. So they, they have a problem with regards to autonomy. They're not autonomous, they're too dependable in their families. Specialty or expertise? If you're lucky, yes. Education gives you enough expertise, but the majority um, lack it and meaning, right? I think that when I refer back to the report and also pay attention to the panel today, I think what's really lacking is that um, youngsters want meaning. There's a great deal of imagination, daydreaming, wanting to marry, but where is the meaning? What kind of a meaning do they expect um, from life? So um, I'm still curious. My initial question was, like you said, a skill set. Um, there's like such myriad ways and means, and you've got to use domain outside of school really well. You need contact, connection, mentorship, um, sort of peer interchange, um, mentorship from top to bottom or from bottom to top mentorship that goes both ways and we now see experience spreading for mentorship that runs both ways i'm not going to say that education at university fails but there are bits and pieces especially as far as recruitment is concerned but find out where universities fail especially um, in promoting the jobs market and let's find innovative solutions as a means of curing these problems you've got teen you've got youngsters in the third or fourth sphere and they're the underprivileged ones the ones in the, in the core they're more okay with it okay let's turn to you and let's refer back to the initial discussion, which is about gender inequality. The photo, how we're going to get rid of gender inequality. And furthermore, we now acknowledge that um, as far as dissenting opinion, dissenting lifestyles, they don't quite like to engage. They like to change the topic or remain silent rather than face or confront dissenting view or dissenting um, lifestyles that may perhaps, don't you think, also replenish inequality. So let's go back to the blog and also based on what you've said so far, how do you think about, what do you think about this? Politics and other instrumentation. Um, a lot has been said already. Gender and women's issues um, are areas where there's vast experience. But I've seen in the report as to um, what the youth ramifications might be. It doesn't thrill me that much. But one of the bits that do excite me and that does motivate me is the fact that like when we set up Rachel, um, we thought, well, women, if people listen to and understand each other's stories, then they can appreciate diversity and transform. And this whole thing or the need for transformation is possible in and amongst youngsters. There's a great deal sort of um, around they don't confront dissenting opinion and they are rather calm and quiet, but they still acknowledge each other's stories because they um, they interact, they intersect, and they appreciate the fact that they might thrill upon and they might be fearful of or they might value totally different lifestyles. It, it is like um, they might be rather 
silent about it and not speak up because they don't like to. And then, and they'll just sort of wait and see um, down the road once they're able to exert influence, right? And I also see this in my own experience, like based on Rachel's experience, because like even my peers, um, there used to be a great deal of straight jacketing. And because we lived in straight jackets, um, we would avoid each other. We wouldn't even physically tolerate each other, right? If we come from a completely different backgrounds, that's gone away. Um, so it's, it's almost like dissipated. It's like oddly, there's an engine club. You've got um, LGBT community, and then you've got like a, um, a conservative female wearing a headscarf there too. And also people from more liberal backgrounds in my experience, I never saw this happen. Whereas now, I see this as heralding change and transformation. The report evidently points in that direction. Your child tells me the same. Like, um, nowadays, women articulate things that they couldn't quite dare articulate in the past. Transformation is evident according to the report. Okay. Um, I thank you for this round. Let's now move on to the Q&A session. Rumeisa has left us on a very positive note. Let's continue, shall we? Contribution, comments, or questions. Whatever you like, basically. Go ahead. Good afternoon. I'm Moza Chipper. I'm a part of Social Change, and I also represent um, the Youth Organizations Forum. Right, so um, youngsters and employment. This is a question for you, Hazem. Now, um, corporations, corporations fail to deliver in terms of change and transformation. You said it's it's costing them too much, and they fail to comprehend. And even if they do comprehend the need for transformation, they fail to catch up. Corporations, it seems, um, in Turkey, won't be able to won't be able to deliver. Like UNDP runs a project which is called Young um, Young Girls Who've Become Engineers in Turkey. Um, from a vocational perspective, there's a great deal of support. The state supports them, but corporations fail. Like nobody, it seems, is ready to recruit engineers who come out of these social programs. Do you believe that this is a barrier for recruiting young talent? Um, or are we going to end up with a brain drain? Or what about job satisfaction? Will they feel apathetic altogether and want to seek jobs elsewhere? Hansen, before you come in to the picture, let's get four or five questions, because then we'll have 10 minutes. OK, jot down your own question so I don't have to repeat, OK? And then we'll move on to the answers. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Just a moment, please. Yes. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Shevai Karada. I'm a medical school student at Koch University. My question is for you, Rumeisa. Now, I went to school in the province of Adiyaman, in middle school. I wanted to move out for schooling, my dad hated it. And exactly like Batuan said, my dad said to me, and my dad actually threatened, and he said, if you go, I'll stop supporting you financially. And he said, go ahead, if you dare leave, leave. And I ended up making it to high school with a grant, a financial grant. I was like in the top quartile. And then I said, and I challenged him, I said, fine, then I'll go. Okay, if you don't support me, I don't care. So um, I wonder, as far as your Rechal blog is concerned, um, has there been like similar experience where, um, in spite of strict parenting, were were there people like me? I don't want to say that we rebelled, but what sort of solutions do you think the young generation might actually design to quote unquote rebel against overly strict parenting? who won't let their kids um, strike it on their own. Okay, so here's another thing. You said, Mehmet Ali, that youngsters comply, although they're unwilling to do so. You're saying that youngsters um, opt for change. 
The survey, however, points that adults adults embrace change, but much they're much more interested in um, success as a result of change, whereas they they don't really care about the process. <laughs> so um, youngsters are obviously dependable. And it certainly inhibits change, progress. Um, and my second question is for Rumesa, and that is um, youngsters and women in particular. You're saying they want to run away from um, strict parenting and want to marry as a means of um, savior. How do you think we can change that perception that women don't seek emancipation through marriage just because their parents are too strict? You have a question? One more? Well, why don't we finish this round and then we'll come back to you once again. Hansen, let's turn to you. You've got all the questions. You're the popular one. Thank you. I got two questions, one of which is to do with corporations, big companies unable to um, change. I didn't say that companies don't want to and that they're reluctant to. I'll just clarify. I'm just saying that um, market dynamics makes things, other things more of a priority like you've got the income distribution or the income group like the low income groups who are earning less you've got a substantial population but we've we've now gone beyond an era where low income groups were overlooked the market now has to cater products and services that also cater to the lower income groups you've got like an immense marketplace that's only yet being discovered so and while you enter that sort of previously undiscovered market, um, traditionally big companies wanted to maximize profit. They, um, they would also like profit, they would also price according to the medium and low income bracket. But that's not good enough. You, they, they've got to um, sideline themselves and generate new business models. They, I think that big corporations are not agile enough to cater to the low income group. Um, they believe that there's a lot of profit to be generated there, but they're not fast enough. And what's filling the void are the new enterprises. New enterprises set up by young generation, women and men. They know the local. They know the needs and wants and aspirations from small businesses. And it's essentially those that big businesses fail to deliver. And it's a totally different way of doing business, not just traditional modus operandi, because traditionally it's been very hierarchical. And who cares about hierarchical big business? It might be useful in some places, but obviously not useful everywhere. So it's more of a matrix, more like down to collaboration, and more about building an ecosystem. So you have like multiple small businesses like supporting each other. So big businesses can't do that. They can't address it, they can't deal with it. Some say they do, some believe they can, but um, collectively or en masse, like you've got Uber, right? Sh or sharing cars. Uber now developing a model on car sharing, very flexible no more hierarchical or regimentation. And the same goes for your mix of it or everything else that you can't li afford to live without. It's not what the young expected, it's more like what the market expected. And big um, big corporations were never, are failing miserably to be agile enough to cater to that demand. And the more they see it, youngsters, the, may, the more they follow suit. Um, if they're talented enough and if they're confident enough. I see that with new graduates. Maybe they go, they become too self-confident, too obnoxious, and you can't even manage them. And because you can't manage them, they can't survive in a big corporate setting. And at the end of the day, they don't want to work for a big company in nothing too fancy, too posh. They don't want to make it, they don't want to like be, they don't want to, um, go there and wait for years and years to promote right they'd like to do the opposite it's it's no longer they think that they can challenge big businesses with a small entrepreneurial venture or they think that they can deliver social and economic benefit uh, by setting up a small enterprise and for them profit is less important I wrote an article which says 
values over valuations. Read that article, which is it's no longer about income. It's much more about value generation. So that's the name of the article. And do I move on to the second question? Rumesa, let's move on to you. Let's get you to answer. Yep, I'll, I, I've got two questions. I'll take them both. So the question is terribly familiar, and hence um, it's incredibly a very, very similar story of mine. So I was able to leave home thanks to a scholarship. And among all authors at Rechal, like my um, adventure with regards to my editorial task is there was this astounding moment. One woman wrote to us saying that she's going to commit suicide. But the father was so strict, wouldn't let her leave the house to attend university in another town. And she said, what can I do? I never, ever found anything so very um, rough and tough. It's like we managed to connect her and we helped her come over here. But we didn't like, we didn't have to go that far. We didn't have to, I don't know, um, go to the extremes. We just talked to her. All we did was we helped her find her own solutions that she was initially capable of finding. So we sort of intermediated to um, and empowered her to find her own solution. And this is like solidarity among women, mechanisms to help build solidarity among women. I think really meaningful. Women might be disenfranchised financially, or there's like um, too strict parenting, mum pressure, daddy pressure. But to deal with it, I think women are now building different ways and means. And it's this very idea that we're now helping to spread out at Rechal. This is the way with which we can become part of the solution. Yes, we need financial support. She had access to financial scholarship, and that's how we managed to get her to Istanbul to further her studies. And it's not like the 28th of um, February that was a watershed. This whole thing about wearing a headscarf is still um, is still an excuse for low low wage. So they think, well, it's almost like they're doing you a favor, um, a condescending favor that women were exposed to just because they were wearing the headscarf. And there's still big businesses that they know they'll never be able to um, get hired in just because they come from a traditional background and that they wear a headscarf. So here's how they um, communicated with us. We're a team of volunteers. We don't have economies of scale, but we, we try to run connections. And so there you go. It has been very useful. And this thing about marriage, the husband figure, yes, you go to school, but ultimately it's about marriage. And you go back to the same chicken and egg syndrome. And that's this, this whole thing about telling stories. That matters so much. The stories tell us that husbands are futile too. Okay, and we say to them, if and where possible, don't marry. Like, happy um, marriage. We don't run your story if you have a very happy marriage with kids and things. How, who is, like, incredibly um, in, an, in a state of euphoria with regards to motherhood and things. So, we don't do that. We don't publish those stories. And I think it's been really influential. Rechal is a small community, a small group of people, but I think we've got the capacity to, to, to reach out, even when there's violence, right? It's not like um, an ultimate solution, but still um, we run stories on marriage is not the ultimate solution. You could end up in, in you know, in, in a much worse situation. So like um, Islam, um, Islam becoming too strict, is that to do with the family or um, sort of promoting marriage and thinking that marriage is, is, is holy according to Islamic w lifestyle. We need to get over this. We do this like rhetorically, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to address these topics from a more corporate perspective and down the road sometime in the future. Two, three more minutes. Botan, you've got it, and then I'll move over to Hansen for his second question. Let me reinstate this. Um, Cheval, Rumesa, both of you have talked about accessing 
financial grant as a means of uh, making your dreams come true. And it speaks for itself, doesn't it? It doesn't have to be financial assistance. Apart from scholarships and things, could be mentorship, could be other things. It doesn't have to be tangible. And, and it's not just public education. We need skills training and also like training in non unconventional ways or for unconventional skills and capabilities. There's a great deal of emphasis on entrepreneurial skills. Not everyone has to become an entrepreneur. You don't access fortune just through um, an entrepreneurial venture, but I think that we need to create build pools um, and resources including arts and social transformation that all can basically so long as they they act upon it artists artists have become venturesome too totally different totally unexpected and also in so social areas and lifestyle not merely economics, right? We see venturesome individuals everywhere. This thing about um, how to how to challenge your family. Um, and by the way, I've got 20 years of experience in development and social affairs. And I'll also tell you based on my own experience. In the 1970s and 80s, when I was a teenager or kid, if you were to, and they would say you um, you're a terrorist if you engage in politics, right? They said, stay away from politics. Or if a group got together on social activism, they would blame you. And um, they'd say, hush, never ever engage in social and political activism. Families um, were hostile to the notion of it. And also, when I became an expert and got a job, NGOs, public entities collaborating, this was like a no-no. People said, why engage with an NGO? If we're a ministry, we don't engage with NGOs. And yet we um, propagated it. And then like um, we wanted um, the age of, the age of um, elec election to become younger. Initially there was resistance, but I think public transformation supports it. But we've come a long way. We're not condescending anymore just because based on our because of where we come from or based on our lifestyle. Change.org, your family is about to sign that petition. They're not going to be condescending. Or just because it could be an NGO, could be a municipality. NGOs, municipalities easily communicate with each other. And um, university students can easily access low-cost transportation because it was like it's, a, it's an entity from Belgium a foreign entity and they're not going to be that's unfair to um, to straightjacket I know it's it's a radical example but I'm just saying um, it no longer exists so professionally and also personally um, I've seen that happen based on personal experience so concordance or compliance and by the way there's reciprocity we're not saying families lack concordance or con um, compliance um, it's more like a reconciliation or compromise when you have both parties willing to um, agree but because of background education groups can always end up in disagreement because of their background but it's all about reaching consensus and reaching compromise um, and conformity I think Turkey has come a long way but still, there's room for improvement, obviously. I thank the panel very much. Thank you to the audience for their patience. And thank you to you um, for sharing with us some very, very noteworthy results, um, generalizations that were rather striking. And thank you to you for being kind enough. So let's break for a little. I think we all deserve tea, coffee. Let's go downstairs to the Palm Court and enjoy um, what's on offer. We'll be back at half past to proceed with the next session. Thank you.
Hello, welcome back. We'd like to carry on from where we left. British Council is the leader of this research, Next Generation Turkey, and welcome back to the second part of our program. As you will recall, in the first part, we had listened to the young people, and in this part, we will again start off with uh, another video. We will listen to them again. We heard the results of the research and after the video that we will share with you, we'll have another panel discussion. We will then be listening to the experiences with youth, family identities and participation. I suppose the outcomes will again be striking during this panel discussion. But before we start on with our panel discussion, let's hear from them how they think, what they think. Let's watch our video and then we'll proceed with our panel discussion. Diğer ülkelerde yani karşındaki kişinin sana saygı duyduğunu hissedebiliyorsun. Yine de vazgeçemem doğduğum topraktan. Önümüz kesiliyor ve bir yerde bir görüşü savunup o görüşün önüne gitmediğimiz için hep bir torpil, hep bir adam kayırmaca vardı hissediyoruz, duyuyoruz da yani bu yüzü aslında bizi. Buraya kendimi çok ait hissediyorum. Burası benim vatanım ve aynı dili paylaştığım, aynı kültürü paylaştığım insanlarla birlikte olmak bana çok güç veriyor. Kendimi daha güçlü hissediyorum bu anlamda. Gelecekle ilgili yani şunu da şunu yapacağım, bunu da bunu yapacağım. Bu yaşta bu yaşımda bunları yapmayı hedefliyorum gibi planlarım Öncesinden vardı, şimdi artık yok. Üniversite okumayı çok isterdim ben ama beş kardeşi okuyamadık. Hani inşaatta da çalışmam gerekiyordu. O yüzden hatta yakın zamanda bu yıl içerisinde açık öğretime başvurdum. O içimde kalmış yani okumuş, okumamış ayrımı çok fazla. Hayatta da çok fazla. Aslında oturduğunuz zaman ya da bir iş görüşmesine gidiyorsun, lise mezun adam hiç konuşmuyor bile. Ya çaycılık gel yap diyor, hadi gel garson yap diyor. Herhalde Türkiye'den çıksam başka bir yerde barınamam. <gülüyor> yani başka bir şehirde yapamam herhalde. Fakat hani yurt dışına da kapılarım kapalı değil. Eğer fırsat olursa gitmeyi düşünüyorum. Akademik olarak belki şey yapabilirim. Yükselmeye çalışırım. Orada yükselme konusunda değil. Kendi birikimi arttırma, ünvan vesaire değil bu konuda. Kendi bilgi birikimi arttırma. Belki yurt dışı konusunda bahsettiğim gibi. So this was one of the basic objectives of this research and as we prepared these videos and shared with you uh, one after another we had a chance to let their voices be heard. Now we will proceed with the panel discussion but before we do that I'd like to make a reminder we would like to kindly ask you to fill in the surveys that we have put in the folders distributed. That will that will indeed be great. Now let's proceed with our panel discussion. We actually had some hints in the interviews we had in the videos and that was mentioned in the inaugural speeches. Families are seen as a great support for young people. At the same time, they are seen ha as a hurdle. So how should we interpret that? What should we say on top of that? This is going to be the main theme of our panel discussion now. Young, young people, youth, family identities and participation. So for this panel discussion, we will have Sarah Titus, who is the founder at GD GDN. The floor is yours, ma'am. Welcome. And let me now introduce our panelists, Mehmet Akın. Yes, please. Espot from Espot. Burcu Oy, Bilgi University, Youth Studies Department, and we have Murat Çekic from uh, TAPV, Deputy General Coordination. Serhanım, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. We as GDN have been involved in this research and uh, we also were involved in policy paper. It has been extremely valuable research and uh, with this occasion we were able to see that there are um, 
there are limited mechanisms to support uh, uh, youth. When we took a look at the necessary uh, documents, young people should participate. Um, that was such a superficial uh, command. But then again, these are the concrete projects. These are the spaces. These are the areas where young people have to be involved. Uh, that was not mentioned. Uh, we believe there is serious gap in that sense. We will be discussing that in a few minutes. And when we talk about identities, unfortunately, young people don't seem to have a status as the youth. When you take a look at the other parts of the world, you see young people as the leaders of innovation and transformation. That's how societies enhance themselves and pro uh, make progress because they have a chance to have their uh, entities or beings uh, uh, appreciated and valued. We also discussed about families. They are seen as a socioeconomical support. And when it comes to the development and realization, self-realization of the youth, they seem to be the hurdle. So it seems like um, that there are challenges for the youth. So we have young people among us. Uh, these are uh, young uh, colleagues. Um, at our panel discussion, they are the voices of NGOs. They are working at non-governmental organizations. That's why um, their opinion indeed uh, mean a lot. Their opinions mean a lot. So let me start with you, Murat. Uh, when we think about the youth profile in Turkey, it's quite uh, dispersed or um, it's quite diverse, I would say, regionally, ethnically, culturally. We see so many uh, different uh, young people need is 36% uh, and uh, this is the highest uh, level in OECD or among OECD countries not employed educated or trained that is the um, um, ideal uh, group of young people I think it is again very high when it comes to women in Turkey so could you share with us your uh, insight and experience uh, you've been involved with young people for uh, years now could you share your insight with us yes of course thank you as I read this report I also uh, looked into the needs and I quite frequently so the interpretation that they are not doing much so who are these young people individually name by name face by face as I try to think of that and as I try to reflect on that I try to remember people that we uh, collaborated and worked uh, with in the field for instance Ishkur Ishkur is in Fundakli, like 15 minutes walking distance from here this is the employment agency state employment agency there are insurance uh, classes offered and as Batohan mentioned uh, during the previous panel discussion there are these vocational professional classes that people may attend so I uh, thought about the young people who are mostly university graduates who are uh, standing in rows waiting to be um, enrolled in this insurance um, insurance class and there is this uh, invisible uh, invisible drug crisis in Turkey and then I thought about young people at, uh, at the age of 25 trying to sell drugs or amphetamine and then I thought about the young people in Shirnak Adiaman and I remember Syrian refugees mm, who are 19 year old or 20 or 21 year old these are young ladies who are expecting babies and this is uh, mostly the third child or the fourth child I mean we may multiply these examples uh, between the ages of 25 and 30 years of age we can multiply these examples for instance I live in Istanbul Kaza Çeşme. the first thing that comes to my mind is that there are these uh, leather shops and leather uh, factories. They, they produce leather and there is a continuous um, delivery of leather. And I frequently see Syrian refugees, young uh, men especially, walking around there in order to find the daily jobs to, to carry. However, they are um, not seen uh, to be uh, that valuable by the 
by the uh, owners of the businesses, so they hardly find jobs. Some are taking care of babies, some are looking for jobs, some are married, some are staying at home, taking care of the elderly or the sick at home. So this is like the invisible group of people, especially the concept of need in that perspective is striking and is something worth reflecting on. And then I thought about uh, and I talked to my colleagues working for uh, a campaign called that send me uh, to school. Why are they um, focusing on these women? 26 percent is uh, the need ratio. 36 percent um, is composed of females and 17 percent of males. We know that there is this notion that they um, stop going to school. So why? Because uh, as they attend the primary school, girls um, are not uh, offered any dream or aspiration or vision. The only thing that they learn about is the better version of the current families that they uh, live in. And this is mostly seen uh, to be accomplished through consumption like a better house or a better car or if they uh, live in a rented apartment they'd like to um, buy their own houses so it's true consumption so it's not necessarily an individual aspiration so having a better family being be well off or going to a well off family and live with them so a better family or establishing starting a family of her own that's well off well that's inevitably meaning that they leave school at an early age for a young girl that means that that young girl will get married at a young age and then expecting a baby and pregnancy and more and more um, infant uh, deaths or child deaths so this becomes such an extended access that it goes all the way to the individual rights and privileges that we should uh, keep in mind. So another question, why don't young people uh, work? Why don't they uh, get education? Why do the young ladies feel themselves obliged to stay at home and take care of the babies? Why are they in this picture? So. This is because there is no ecosystem. That's also referred to in the research. I think it's in the introduction comment uh, made by Batuan. There is no ecosystem to empower young people. So what is meant by that ecosystem? What kind of an ecosystem should that be? What should the elements of that ecosystem be? I try to have a brainstorming on that. And then I will now be sharing with you the things that come to my mind. The healthcare system. Healthcare system is one of the most important pillars of that ecosystem. Think about young ladies. The current healthcare system in Turkey is based on pregnancy and pregnancy progress. Other than pregnancy, there is no other notion for young ladies uh, in the healthcare system. If you're not married, if you live in Istanbul, and if you go to a local uh, clinic or to a state hospital, you may not even get uh, a proper gynecological examination. There were some stories um, shared, young ladies shared their stories about uh, gynecologists and the first question they said they were confronted with was whether they were a virgin or not. Just imagine, I mean, this is the initial bit. You go to see a doctor. This is something that I frequently hear, so that came to my mind. And since this is the um, week uh, for HIV and AIDS awareness, 400% is the increase of HIV uh, cases. And Turkey is one of the leading countries. Well, in this whole education system or curriculum, not even one single sentence referring to HIV or AIDS um, and how that uh, is contagious. You can either, you can only learn it when you go attend a medical school. It's impossible to get a brochure or an informative uh, leaflet or anything. This was the first thing. In addition to the healthcare system, another leading uh, system is the education system. Many things have already been said about it. For instance, there are these vocational high schools, and in five cities, 
uh, of Turkey, Istanbul, Ankara, Izmir, Sakarya, Eskişehir. If you attend one of these vocational schools and then if you uh, further your studies in specific technical um, departments, you will then be quite fortunate to find a job in the automotive industry, like if you study engine and engine parts. We work with those vocational high schools for a long time, and what we see is as follows. There is this young girl after two or three years will be uh, will be 18 years old will either be a net or a net so when she uh, is interested in uh, furthering her studies about the motor about the engine of the cars the instructor or the professor says no that's not appropriate for you that's a man's job so when that's the case even though she graduates from the same school as her uh, male uh, friends, she is unable to find a job. If she goes, if she graduates and then goes to an automobile industry uh, company to have her internship, if she's lucky to make it that way, the company says that you don't have to even come here all the way. You just stay uh, at home and then we'll fill in your forms and then we'll make sure that your internship is completed. Even though she has the qualifications, she is unable to um, uh, develop her skills. We had this project last year, schooling of uh, girls at the industrial vocational school. Rather than persuading or convincing the uh, female pupils uh, to further enhance their skills, they were offering them specific classes on jewelry making rather than convincing them to study technical things. Well, it's not only that. Uh, also, the parents say that this is a boy's job or a girl's job. There is a mechanism to support the family. The families are not uh, going through a process to empower their children either. So there is yet another pillar in this ecosystem, uh, employment labor everyone talks about uh, women's uh, women's employment and uh, women to be employed i mean development agencies and ngos they all talk about employment of women but no one utters one single word about who will take care of the uh, baby unless you take that burden or responsibility away from the shoulders of women how is she to be employed? I mean, you offer a class on entrepreneurship, great, and then women should participate, great, but who will take care of the child at home? That's the key question. And this, for instance, the other day we had a senior manager from a bank, an HR manager. Uh, we were discussing this, and then this HR manager said that we have given uh, maternal leave uh, to all the ladies working at the bank so that they could breastfeed. You can actually make a guess about the profile. I mean, most of the most of the women that would work at that bank would be included in this age profile. However, branch managers don't let uh, don't let their female employees um, use that uh, right. This is a large bank from Trabzon to Van, from Mula to Izmir. They have branches. And just imagine, it is the general manager of the bank who will give the ultimate permission to the female employees to uh, have a maternal leave and have their breastfeeding uh, leave. Being a woman in the employment market, positive, uh, unless we establish a mechanism for positive discrimination, um, it won't mean much. It won't mean anything. I mean, if these are the initial things that come to my mind when I think about need and uh, women uh, to be involved in employment in order to in order to well i mean when i think about these elements of the ecosystem these are the initial things that come to my mind and most of these elements are missing unfortunately finally i would like to remind one more thing which is as follows family as a notion this was uh, this was discussed during the previous panel discussion families unfortunately especially for young women 
um, starting a family of their own is not really a lifesaver. Remember, so many women have been murdered by their own family members, I mean, by their relatives and family members. So for young women, family is not really um, a lifesaver. If they switch from one family to another, they marry into a family, but that does not necessarily help them get um, over with all those uh, hurdles. Unless you offer the mother's opportunities, it is uh, rather impossible to to expect something different. This is the f these are the initial thoughts for the first round. Thank you very much for the snapshot. Let's continue with you, Mehmet. When uh, we think about uh, excluded or isolated groups, we have LGBT, we have the immigrants, we have the refugees. These people also live on this uh, soil, and they also are in an effort to uh, realize themselves. So, do they have the chance to do so? And how do the you how do the young people establish relationship between or among one another? But when they come together, they stay silent and they keep it to themselves. That was what we saw in the research um, presented. Could you share with us some examples of that? Thank you very much. Thank you. As I answer your question, I would like to mention the minority groups, L, um, LGBT plus refugees. It's not only the ethnical groups that are classified as minorities. Minority group members, the biggest hurdle in front of them is the legal inequality. When I say legal, it's not necessarily limited to the rights and privileges not granted to them, but these rights and privileges are not granted to the members of these minority groups either. Plus, they also are um, somehow discriminated. According to the current constitution, uh, LGBT members are not uh, protected. And as you know, we call them refugees, but legally, uh, refugees are not recognized. Only the applications coming from the Western um, countries would be uh, would be classified as refugees. These are temporary residents, or as you know, Syrians are under temporary protection, and they are granted some rights and they have access to some rights. These um, legal inequalities for these groups. I also would like to say a few things about uh, ethnical um, groups: Armenians, Jewish uh, community, and. Also, other minorities. They are not also. They are not seen uh, equal either. And uh, people who do not have a Turkish identity are not treated equally. This inequality brings along um, a feeling of uh, unjust treatment and injustice. At a very early age, they start seeing that. When we say young people, this is even prior to the age of 18. You see and understand that I I'm not equal to others around me or in my surrounding and identities are not equal and then you associate that with identities and that that brings along a great um, feeling of hopelessness so mm -hmm. politics the political and the legal system in Turkey turned to into another you're alienated just imagine you are a transsexual, you are given, uh, you are granted a sexual identity, you do have an ID card, either a pink one or a, a blue one, but you're not happy with that, you're not satisfied with that, you'd like to change that, but the legal system and the uh, um, and the c civil uh, law says that you first of all have to uh, apply to the court and then this is going to involve a lengthy psychological and medical process. You start that at the hospital. You're first um, to see psychologists, psychiatrists, um, genetic specialists. You go through surgeries. Hardly any of these surgeries uh, are afforded or reimbursed by the insurance um, companies, just like the right uh, to have abortion for women. I mean, there is said to be the right to have abortion in Turkey, but then again, they are confronted with difficulties. The same rule applies to transgender surgeries in your 20s. Um, in their 20s, they become obliged to be a part of the um, a part of the 
sexual uh, sector, as the saying goes, and they become uh, um, a part of the uh, system. You work in an unsafe environment. You then uh, are obliged to stay away from your family and from school. Only a few of the transgender uh, individuals would continue their training. The same rule applies to the Syrian refugees. Just imagine you come, you migrate to Turkey. There is no legal system to support you. You're detached from your family. Language is a barrier and the future is just ambiguous. You don't know anything about your future. There are news every single day that you may be deported. You're like a political um, card uh, to be played. So we're talking about a large group. And these groups, all these groups, have something in common. These identities of themselves, they feel they feel that it is the only solution to disguise their identities. For some, it's possible to disguise that. And for some others, it's not. For instance, if you're an Armenian and if your name or your surname is an Armenian one, it is hardly possible that you may disguise your identity or you may always be confronted with uh, discrimination because of the looks that you have being a transgender or being um, African or being black. I mean, these are all these are things that you do your best to disguise as much as possible so that you can find yourself a place in the social life and find your way through with it. And other heterosexuals, Turkish people and Muslim, uh, the, the Muslims uh, have certain support mechanisms. One support mechanism to mention is family for them. However, for these minority groups, how are these young people to get support from their families? Uh, being dependent on your family is a mechanism, but these individuals are hardly able to make use of that uh, mechanism. For instance, as you're born, you, uh, as you're born, you are uh, exposed to discrimination. For instance, in social life, in uh, in school life, and in business life, if you are um, uh, if you are discriminated, you're discriminated since from the beginning. Especially if you're an homosexual, that starts. Uh, um, that, spo uh, that starts in uh, family life. Uh, I work at SPOT and I say I'm an open um, homosexual, uh, but though I am explicitly mentioning that, my family does not know what my um, sexual tendency is and what my profession is. Just imagine, I find the power to uh, explicitly express that in media, but I'm unable to do that with my own family. As we take a look at uh, young people uh, that have different ethnical backgrounds, most of the time these identities are seen to be political and they are warned about uh, disguising that or at least not mentioning that explicitly. Families of minorities may have um, extremely um, um, strict mechanisms and these are most of the time conservative to protect themselves from violence from discrimination they are more introverted so that they may protect themselves and uh, and their children and young people uh, are reluctant to stay within that small ecosystem there may be differences in income and regional differences but do you think that also has an impact on young people specifically yes of course for instance, I come from a small city, both regarding the means and opportunities and the diversity, it was quite restricted where I, ca where I come from. But Istanbul um, uh, or in any other Western cities, you may be more fortunate, but again, it's all pure luck. What about university or education? Uh, educational uh, surroundings and NGOs. Do you think there's discrimination? I can say it's less, but still, 
at the universities that continues I mean discrimination so those uh, stereotypes don't change yeah young people being um, exposed to discrimination especially these minority group members um, this is actually the discrimination that they um, encounter among themselves. For instance, a homosexual may be alienated by the heterosexual young people. So education and training, that, that may open doors, but still they may sometimes not suffice. Social, uh, social policies are extremely important. The, one of the basic things about social policies is that for disadvantaged groups, uh, privileges or um, uh, privileges may be given so that discrimination is prevented. But as you know, social policies are now um, the responsibility of uh, ministry, and it says social policies and families. Families being a core family composed of a man, woman, and a child. When one says family, everyone may have a different notion, but in this uh, stereotype, the woman stays at home. Well, it's given as a privilege to women that uh, they give up uh, their work when they get married. They may actually report that to their workplace saying that I'm married and my husband does not permit me to work and that's given as a right. So they do not have the capacity to protect children. So in this next generation research, one of the findings was that families are seen as a support mechanism by the youth, but then again, they are seen as a, um, uh, as a, a mechanism to apply pressure. Uh, how possible is it for young people to uh, get out of that? If you're, uh, if you are uh, gay in Turkey. Uh, at least in the near future, it is not uh, possible to establish a family, officially at least. Thank you very much for the snapshot. Thank you. Now it's uh, your turn, Burju. You've been working with young people and participation of youth. You have NGO experience as well as academic background. So do you think young people find the means and uh, necessary setting to uh, realize themselves? How do they express themselves? Social media is a part of that as well. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, of course, uh, both in the research and in the youth uh, research and survey, I am involved, but I'm not one of uh, them. So I will tell you what they tell us. It will be limited to that. Yes, as I was young, um, I was also involved. It's not only the things executed by the youth, uh, uh, but then again, uh, wherever and whenever young people are involved, I really enjoy being a part of these things. Statistics and research always draw us a picture, but then again, participation as a word is something we should question. Participation for what? We should ask that. Uh, when you turn participation into a into a concept which is like idealized, the results may not necessarily uh, show us the actual outcomes. If young people see themselves a vehicle or a tool in a research, do you think they uh, see this as participation? Or if young people are able to uh, make a change with their presence, um, is it indeed participation but is it just pretension or is it the pretend is it pretension or is it real participation so what does this participation serve for and as they participate do these young people um, find the opportunity to reflect themselves as they are i'm not going to talk about this or that research but when we think about field studies quantitative field studies and also focus group meetings we come up with certain conclusions when i think about these conclusions i see that participation is possible only when young people are able to present themselves explicitly and express the problems and hurdles in their lives when they are able to work on these problems and challenges then they are able to participate but there's no one single mode of participation there is uh, 
there were some ratios mentioned about participation in political life. This is similar to the previous research, 4 to 5 percent of participation in um, politics. And when you take a look at voting, uh, it is quite high. So if they vote and if the percentage of voting uh, is high, would that necessarily mean that they are active and actively participating in politics? We uh, focused on uh, these uh, studies and it's quite pleasing. Unfortunately, this has shown us that other participation mechanisms, the non-conventional ones like non-governmental participation, use of social media, attending protests and rallies, or writing petitions to the public authorities, such participation mechanisms are unfortunately not that active as the conventional ones. For certain groups, these are used used and utilized and that gives a uh, room and space to the users this empowers them indeed significantly but there are so many other groups that are unable to use those mechanisms so the question is when we talk about participation and participation of young people and participation of disadvantaged um, groups of young people unless they are able to participate this becomes a vicious circle and then there is a gap in the democracy so certain circles are not even to represent themselves or find representation in certain um, sectors of the society. We uh, discussed that in the previous panel discussion as well. So the next question is, how are we going to make participation possible? One way to achieve this, a certain group of young people um, um, is able to do that compliance with authority authorities sometimes the state or the public sector the authorities some other times the family it's not actually a voluntary uh, compliance as uh, as uh, this was mentioned by another um, a speaker there is this uh, compulsory uh, compulsory uh, compliance and although they don't believe in these values they pretend as if they do some are able to do that some others think that this is a concession and they do not prefer to do that and when they don't prefer to do that they are excluded from this participation system but actually that's a political stance as well because that's actually standing against the current system so it's an active uh, a political uh, stance. So when we think about um, participation as a concept, so what do they participate in? What do what don't they participate in? And the reasons behind that. I can also mention one more thing, and this is what uh, the research has shown us. Discussing families actually is not sufficient. I mean that gives me um, a stomach ache. Just imagine, this is uh, reaching such levels that uh, we cannot discuss young people aside from families. We always attach them with families. Yeah, young people stay with their families, even though they have social secu security. They still, uh, they still have um, money coming from their uh, families. When they are to seek jobs, they try to do it through their families or friends or um, coincidence um, or uh, relatives. So, I mean, just imagine if they detach themselves for from their families, how long will they survive? 80% of them says that uh, they won't last a month. Just imagine they're not supported as, um, as a citizen. So how will they participate as they are detached from their families? How will they exist with their own um, with their own means so equal and uh, autonomous individual to be defined uh, independent from their families that's the first thing and to be able to ensure participation we should have expression mechanisms and spaces of expression this is a human right participation is a human right if we perceive it as such which it is we have to ensure that there's access to social rights and that there are no hurdles or barriers in front of these basic rights because participation is closely related to that so only with the condition that young people are supported with these mechanisms if their social rights and privileges are enhanced their participation and their capabilities will enhance our research also supports that for instance 
students to participate in NGO activities. Yes, that's uh, true because there are more advantages. I'm not only talking about economic capital, also, uh, but also social capital. But who is active among these students? You take a look and see that the ones on uh, in the ones that have scholarship. Uh, uh, <laughs> The ones that have scholarship and the ones that get support from their families have more room to maneuver and then they're able to participate in the NGO activities. The data tells us that if we empower young people as equal and independent individuals, then they may create opportunities to participate. So this is how I see um, how I see it and how I think is the way out. We should also keep in mind that uh, internet is one of the non-conventional um, means to participate. In the last decade or so, access to internet and use of internet has been developed. But here we see that uh, when we take a look at the uh, balance of powers, young people are more advantageous in because they have the know-how when compared with adults. They're more empowered. But among themselves, how Internet is used, when we take a look at that, we see that it's seen as a medium to socialize, but that's the more disadvantageous uh, sector who is using it as a political uh, means well uh, only the ones that are politically active use internet as a um, tool to participate uh, in political affairs so will it create a space for the disadvantages one that's a question mark but when compared with the adults it is more uh, for the young we should also not forget the following that those conventional participation modes and in the areas of decision making participation of the young is low uh, the voice of the young is not heard that much so just imagine the impact of this and the impact that the young people create on internet so non-conventional participation modes we have to think of mechanisms to make them more active in the decision making process if those are the media where they are more active so you have actually given the formula for that so before we close i also would like to turn to mehmet and uh, murat uh, how you think is a way out briefly i can talk about one thing this is about the budget especially in the report there were references made to need and share of women in um, need that's a key topic if you ask me there is this whole generation of lost uh, a lost a whole lost generation of women these are uh, women who are only involved in child care who have given birth to two or three children and the most thing they can do is they work um, in family business, like uh, maybe a family-run company or on the field, in the agricultural field. That's a loss uh, generation. It may be in Antalya, in Erzurum, or Samsun. And they have similar life cycles, uh, independent from the geography. So regarding this lost generation of women, we should do something. Nothing is done for them not from the non-governmental perspective or civil society perspective or from the economic perspective anything is done only if they stop by the office or company um, i'm sorry correction if they are exposed to violence something is done other than that nothing is done maybe it's the local governments that have to intervene otherwise this may not uh, this may not be realized through the central government local governments have to be empowered and local governments have to be mobilized and there should be incentives to mobilize them i think this is the key point regarding this lost generation of women we have not discussed that but there are the disabled um, they are also uh, to be included in the net group that's another uh, sociopolitical issue and it's our it's our fault that we have not mentioned that so um, collaboration with stakeholders uh, private sector public sector non-governmental organizations and civil society Mehmet any additional comments there's this interesting data from the research which goes young people's way of establishing relationship with different groups 
uh, the question was asked specifically about gays and lesbians. 53% of the young people said that they have no interaction with these um, uh, with these people. Well, that's wrong. Well, the question is uh, correct and the question is um, posed correctly, but gays and lesbians are everywhere. I mean, it's impossible that you have no interaction. They, they, they are in your families as well. They are at your schools. They are in your classroom. It's impossible that uh, it's impossible that uh, they don't exist. It's all negligence. I mean, it's not. It's just. Uh, it's not isolation, but it's um, isolation. Uh, Twenty-three percent say that uh, they are distancing themselves. So 53% just ignore them. 23% may be put on that. So it's like 80% of young people think that, uh, think in that respect. So uh, this is actually a big hurdle for LGBT. But the ones that are distancing themselves and the ones that are negative about them, I think uh, there may be a concrete hope in that, that 53%, maybe it's possible to establish dialogue with that 53%. Well, there was no such discrimination during our times. Uh, our parents used to say, no, we didn't know who was Kurdish, who was um, belonging to another minority group. Well, that's something to, thought of, uh, to think of its uh, uh, food for thought, because um, they were unable to disclose themselves. That's why they didn't know these people. So. Young people should not say that there is no interaction with them. Instead, uh, we should say they don't see LGBT uh, people. They should open themselves up to LGBT. Uh, many people have a responsibility to undertake, but I'm hopeless um, in this. Um, in that sense, I don't know whether you know this. Last week in Ankara, LGBT activities have been banned infinitely and British Council was in an effort to have a film festival here in Istanbul however that was also banned by the sub governor's office and most of them were young I mean the majority is young people and these young people shot movies and these movies would be watched by other young people so how can we have access to this 53 percent of the young people I'm not sure how we may communicate with them or get in touch with them that's why I I say I'm hopeless. I don't know what is possible and what is not possible. That hope, I suppose, should be preserved and nurtured in ourselves. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the audience? These are the final minutes before we close. There is a question from the back. Hello, Erdal is my name uh, from um, Civil Pages. Mehmet Bey, my question is for you. Hansen Doan from UNDP said something uh, about young people uh, leaving home and um, starting their own families. The society is open to uh, change and families embrace themselves. Can we say the same thing for LGBT families? Um, LGBT is coming from such families. Do you think they're also encountering this transformation? What do you mean by that, families? LGBTs, LGBTs uh, who have heterosexual parents, that's what I mean. And the second question is that as a methodology, you talked about the family authority, um, uh, girls running away from their parents' authority and then handing themselves in their husband's authority. Do the LGBT young youth um, does the LGBT youth have a methodology to to overcome that interesting question should I answer now in the previous panel discussion uh, there was a hopeful picture drawn especially it was said that especially the society is more open now we can hardly claim that LGBT became more visible. I can say that personally, yes, when compared with 70s, it's now more open. We can talk about these topics, but both legally and socially, uh, we can hardly talk about uh, any concrete developments. So I would say that society being open and LGBT is putting us put aside from the society. This is one of the mistakes, and we should not fall into that 
this is one of the reasons of the ban. Uh, sensitivities of the society was presented as an excuse. It's as if LGBT is not included in the society. That's how the picture is drawn. So is the society open to LGBT? That we can't know, but we can say that we have become more visible and we have more LGBT uh, individuals uh, finding for themselves a space and media to express themselves but both generally and specifically regarding the LGBTs I don't see any advancement or opening up for LGBT individuals I agree with uh, what you say as uh, one of the former sh um, chairs of the Association for LGBT uh, for the second question, please, would you also answer to that question? Uh, what do LGBT individuals do when they de try to detach themselves from their families? Well, they don't establish extremely different mechanisms. I don't think or don't think that LGBT members uh, live by themselves, especially bisexual or transsexual men uh, with pink um, ID cards or lesbians don't think that they live on their own why do you see why do you uh, mostly see um, men as gay rather than women I as a gay man I'm here uh, not uh, anyone else is here to, to address why because it's very difficult to continue uh, one's life with bisexual or lesbian uh, identity yeah most of them get married it's not uh, their preference but they try to somehow run away from that uh, oppression so they go find themselves a spouse so that they can uh, leave home alternatives or alternative solutions maybe organ organizing but that's very difficult in Turkey by now many LGBT activists say that my family is my uh, circle of friends and other LGBT individuals with whom they organize that's a solution microphone please legally yeah indeed that's that's closed anyway for middle class and upper class I mean if you are a member of these either of these classes you may actually flee um, overseas or you may continue your life overseas especially in Europe and uh, US you have the right to start a family not just for the sake of starting a family but because of the fact that most of your rights and privileges are under protection but still if you're a member of a lower class if you are uh, if you have a, a more disadvantageous identity such as a lesbian there are hardly any alternative solutions any other questions no, I suppose so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your participation. And thank you. Okay. We will have a picture together and then we will ask you to proceed to your seats. Thank you very much once again so family identities and participation has been uh, discussed during the panel discussion striking examples and uh, also um, interesting extremely interesting ideas have been presented we are drawing to a close and we would like to thank you very much for your participation we will now proceed downstairs to the palm court for our networking reception thank you very much and have a pleasant evening